Okay, uh, let's get started. Um, welcome to the uh, press conference at the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. Uh, my name is Tetsuo Jimbo. I'm a long-term member here and uh, chairman of the um, Professional Activities Committee. And uh, uh, our speaker today is Mr. Uh, Hiroaki Koide, uh, former assistant professor of Kyoto University. And actually, we've been asking uh, Mr. Koide to uh, come to our club to speak for a long time, um, but uh, he's been always busy and uh, he hasn't been, been able to come. Uh, but finally, uh, I'm very happy to have him today with us. Um, he's, uh, Mr. Koyede is a long, uh, long time uh, nuclear scientist, but he is one of the very rare species, as you know, in Japan, in Japan's so-called nuclear village, because um, he says he studies the uh, nuclear science not to promote the uh, nuclear technology, but to study, to learn the danger of the uh, nuclear uh, technology. And uh, since the Fukushima Daiichi uh, accident four years ago, Mr. Koide has appeared in thousands of new um, lecture events and interviews. Um, but uh, for some reason, um, I don't see him much on TV and newspapers. I wonder, I wonder why that is. But anyway, he's uh, 65 years old, and he has just retired from the Kyoto University, where he has worked for 41 one years. 41 years? Yes. 41 years. And he may be retiring from the Kyoto University, but I am very sure that he is not really retiring. I'm sure he, he, he's going to tell us that, uh, what he's going to do uh, after Kyoto. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Hiroaki Koide. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I am uh, Hiroaki Koide, a former assistant professor of Kyoto University. Um, thank you for gathering for this place. Um, I'm sorry, I am bad at English speech, so I asked Ms. Takamas to interpret my speech. Um, let's start my speech. Uh, so as you can see from the title of my uh, presentation, four years have passed since the Fukushima uh, number one power plant accident occurred. Uh, since that time, we've received many, many uh, announcements from the Japanese government and from TEPCO. But um, my impression is that the uh, announcements are very limited in nature and uh, that they are, contain many, many errors. Uh, so today I'd like to describe for you the actual situation uh, regarding Fukushima. The photo of uh, Fukushima. So as you can see, this is the an aerial photograph of the Fukushima number one power plant. Starting from uh, the right hand side, we see unit number one, and moving towards the left, we see two, three, and four. I'm sorry, I skipped uh, a slide. I'm going to go back. No, uh, when units number one, two, and three were actually in operation uh, when the earthquake hit on uh, March third, uh, March eleventh, excuse me, two thousand eleven. So this uh, photograph, as you can see. Uh, Actually, uh, units number one and three were uh, operating at that time, and when the earthquake and then the tsunami hit, uh, it, it uh, set off a, uh, a series of uh, events where the reactor core actually melted, and during the process of this melting, a great deal of hydrogen was emitted into the air, and as a result, there was a hydrogen explosion, and, just, and as you can see, the uh, reactor buildings themselves have been severely damaged. Uh, over on the left-hand side, we see unit number four. Uh, you can see that the reactor building has been uh, very much destroyed. However, unit number four was not operating on March 11th, uh, 2011, so there was no uh, uh, nuclear fuel in the reactor core. So the uh, events that I just described for you for units one and three, in other words, the melting of the reactor core, did not occur uh, for unit number four. In spite of this, however, for some reason, there was a similar hydrogen explosion, and as you can see, the reactor building was severely damaged. Uh, because uh, the uh, unit number four was not operating at that time of the earthquake and tsunami, all of the uh, fuel was taken out of the reactor core and put into what we call the spent fuel pool. Uh, the spent fuel pool, however, um, as you can see, uh, was on the fourth floor, and it's uh, basically an area, a part of the building where there are no longer any walls or ceiling roof. 
I know that uh, all of you are aware of the fact that there are many radioactive materials that were um, emitted by this uh, accident and that there are many things that we must worry about. Uh, however, when uh, uh, nuclear power plants or reactors uh, operate, they produce a great number of different types of radioactive materials. Of them, the one that I think is most dangerous to humanity is cesium-137. I mentioned earlier that the reactor building uh, for uh, unit number four uh, was uh, very much destroyed and uh, the spent fuel uh, pool uh, was exposed to the air and sort of hanging uh, in mid-air. In the spent fuel pool for reactor number four, which was completely exposed to the air, uh, there it was enough cesium-137 equivalent to 14,000 bombs uh, that were dropped in Hiroshima. I'll say that again. There was enough C-137 uh, in the spent fuel uh, pool to, uh, that was equivalent to one for 14,000 um, hydrogen bombs, uh, A-bombs that were dropped on, excuse me, Hiroshima. Uh, there was a danger um, at that time that uh, the uh, spent fuel uh, rods in that spent fuel pool uh, might eventually, uh, because it was, they were still continuing to emit heat, that eventually all the water in that pool will dr would dry up. And if the uh, pool uh, water would all dry up, uh, that would create a situation where the spent fuel uh, rods would begin to melt it themselves. And that would create a terrible situation where probably people in the Tokyo area would have to evacuate as well. This is not just my uh, personal opinion, but it was actually the opinion expressed in a report by Mr. Kondo, who was the head of the Nuclear, uh, en uh, Nuclear Energy Commission uh, at that time. I think many of you journalists uh, in this room may remember uh, that there were some days immediately following the accident where uh, we had uh, self-defense forces helicopters uh, fly above uh, the power plant to drop water uh, onto the plant. And also we had members of the Tokyo Fire Department bring very, very long hoses and try to again put power, put water in into the plant. But actually what they were focusing on was unit number four. They had to somehow keep that spent fuel uh, pool filled with water. How they didn't, if they were not successful, they thought uh, Tokyo could be uh, destroyed. Yes. So uh, things have continued uh, at uh, Fukushima Power Plant for the last four years, and many such some progress, some not. But you may remember that in 2011, uh, the party in power was the Democratic Party of Japan. You may also recall that in December of 2011, uh, the uh, Prime Minister at that time, Prime Minister Noda, uh, made an official declaration that uh, the uh, accident uh, at Fukushima a nuclear power plant number one had been brought to a close. The Japanese term is shusoku shita. My reaction on hearing his words were, stop kidding. Uh, yes. The reality is that even though four years have passed, uh, the accident uh, situation has not yet been brought to a close at all. As I said earlier, uh, the biggest danger uh, that everyone uh, involved uh, was aware of was the fact that the uh, unit number four, the spent fuel, although it was not operating at the time of the accident, the, the greatest danger lay uh, with unit number four, this spent uh, fuel pool. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there was a great deal of cesium, uh, 14,000 um, uh, times uh, the amount of, of the bomb that was dropped on uh, Hiroshima. Uh, that cesium was simply sitting uh, in that pool, and if that CCM were to be released into the air, then that would be the greatest, gravest danger uh, that could be presented to Tokyo and to Japan. Uh, this was a crisis situation. Uh, something needed to be done about this. And everyone at TEPCO and everyone at the Japanese government knew how serious this situation was. And they truly made efforts to try to deal with this situation. But it was not until November of 2013 that finally the process of removing those spent fuel rods from the spent fuel pool at unit number four was gradually, it was begun. And it took about a year and it was not until 2014, November, a year later, that um, all of the spent fuel rods were extracted from the unit number four pool and moved to a slightly less dangerous common uh, spent fuel pool uh, nearby. Uh, I was so, so grateful and glad that uh, this uh, work was finally done and finished. Uh, I was relieved because I thought at last uh, the uh, possibility that uh, Tokyo might have to be abandoned uh, suddenly uh, has at last been cleared. We have been able to discard that uh, fear. Having said this, however, uh, although this uh, terribly great danger was uh, somehow at least uh, overcome uh, for the time being, uh, that does not mean that we're out of a crisis situation at all. As I mentioned, I've so far been talking about unit number four, but uh, there's another great concern, which is what is the situation regarding uh, units number one and three. As I mentioned, uh, there was a meltdown of the core, uh, but exactly what is the situation within uh, the core? Uh, where, how much has melted? Uh, where is the fuel exactly? We do not know. 
Why do we not know what the situation is in these uh, units number one to three? It's because nobody can go to the site and see with their own eyes, can check with their own eyes. Uh, the radiation levels are so high that if a person were to uh, try to go inside, uh, that person would die immediately. Even robots, uh, which are now being employed to try to, uh, as, uh, to gauge the situation inside, they uh, are very fragile when it comes to very high radiation levels. All of the robots that have been sent in have not been able to return as a result. I would like to um, impress upon you that this is an accident of a severity uh, that uh, cannot be imagined uh, anywhere else. In other words, an accident, a terrible thing occurs, uh, you're not able to go, even though four years have passed to close by to the site to see what has happened. Uh, that kind of a situation arises only with a nuclear power plant accident. There's no other similar situation. So as you can see, uh, we are facing a very, very difficult situation. And the only choice that we have uh, open to us is to somehow uh, keep the situation from getting worse. And the only way that we can do that is to continually, continually uh, keep pumping water into the plant so that uh, there is no overheating. But as you know, uh, the more water that we pump in, uh, the more contaminated water, uh, irradiated water we produce. We cannot avoid this terrible uh, situation. Even today, every single day, 300 to 400 tons of contaminated water are being uh, produced. And uh, as a result uh, of uh, great efforts to keep this contaminated water from entering the uh, more general environment, uh, we have people on the site, workers on the site, working night and day to try to contain this. When I talk about the workers who are working night and day uh, to try to contain uh, the situation, uh, I'm not talking about TEPCO employees. There are no TEPCO employees doing that kind of dangerous work. Uh, it's not even the subcontractors uh, who are doing this kind of work. It's the sub 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 contractors. We go there's a level of about eight, nine, maybe ten layers, and it's the people at the very bottom uh, who are uh, actually doing the work. And it is said that so many uh, commissions are taken from their salaries that they're not even receiving minimum wage. I think you will all recall uh, the terrible situation in Chernobyl in 1986 when they had their uh, nuclear power plant accident. It has been said that uh, anywhere from 600,000 to 800,000 people were called upon to try to deal with that situation. Uh, the 600,000 to 800,000 people included um, uh, actual military uh, personnel, also uh, retired veterans, uh, just general workers, and also it is said some convicts were uh, recruited uh, to take care of this situation. Uh, in Japan, would we be able to find that many people uh, to uh, deal with the situation? Uh, I do not think that is a possibility at all. In fact, as it is, we're already seeing a great many num a great a large number of foreign workers uh, working at Fukushima. Uh, as you know, uh, Japan uh, is now led by the administration, uh, uh, which is composed of the uh, members of the ruling uh, party, the LDP, uh, and uh, also the uh, Prime Minister, is Mr. Abe, a man who has very clearly uh, set out his, his main priority, um, economic uh, recovery, economic expansion. As a result, he has uh, worked very hard to bring the Olympics to Japan. Uh, in order uh, to make the uh, Olympic big successful, he gave a speech uh, 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 on the international stage where he declared that the Fukushima accident was under control. Uh, however, uh, that is not the situation at all. On a daily basis, there are workers on the site who are struggling to, to somehow uh, deal with the situation. And every day they are being irradiated. And this struggle, this daily struggle of the workers there will continue for years to come, for decades to come. I've been explaining how uh, much the uh, workers on site have been struggling in spite of the ra irradiation they receive to try to contain uh, the radioactive materials and try to keep the radioactive materials from being um, introduced into the environment. Having said this, in spite of their great efforts, there has unfortunately already been a lot of, a great deal of radioactive materials that have been introduced into the environment. Even as we sit here talking today, uh, every single moment, uh, people uh, in uh, this area, beginning prim centered primarily around the Fukushima prefecture uh, area, are receiving uh, radiation. Uh, and this uh, being irradiated, being exposed to radiation uh, situation will continue for years to come, for decades to come, possibly for centuries to come. Real shot of the uh, Fukushima plant. So this is an aerial shot. Uh, you can see uh, units number one to four on the southern part of the uh, uh, slide. And then up above, you have number five and number six. Uh, reactors number five and six don't come into the news very much. They were very fortunate because one emergency generator managed to operate that day. And so there was no uh, meltdown of the core. However, as you can see, reactors number one to four uh, have had all of these different um, uh, problems. And they are a great deal of radioactive material.
materials were therefore emitted into the air. Um, and, in, and not only this, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they constantly have to uh, be kept cool. As a result, uh, contaminated water is being produced in great amounts each day. And they are being put into, as you can see in that little square, uh, these tanks. It was Tepico's idea to somehow contain this water into these tanks. Already 500,000 tons of uh, contaminated water are in these tanks. Although Tepico was working hard to build tank after tank after tank, uh, there was a limit to um, how much uh, physical space there is available in this site for building of tanks. So I think in the not too distant future, Tepico will have to make a decision and say that it will start uh, releasing some of the contaminated water into the ocean. So. Uh, I should also um, point out that although they are making these tanks, these tanks are not really uh, permanent solid tanks, but rather sort of provisional uh, temporary uh, tanks. Uh, the reason is that uh, if one were to try to create, uh, build uh, more sturdy, solid, uh, permanent tanks, it means that during that process, uh, the workers would be irradiated even more. There would be too much exposure to radiation, so they have to just simply manage with these tanks uh, that are available. However, that means that because they were not uh, designed for such long usage, we're seeing all sorts of leaks occur from time to time. And in addition to this, as you can see from the photograph, uh, the reactor buildings, the turbine uh, housing building also was damaged. And as a result, there's a great deal of water uh, that goes through uh, these facilities and contaminated water, therefore, is uh, leaking throughout the entire facility. In fact, we can look at all of Fukushima number uh, one uh, power plant, uh, the whole facility, and say it's like a very highly contaminated swamp. So uh, as you can see from this slide, uh, I mentioned that this whole uh, entire facility was like a, uh, a swamp, a contaminated swamp. Uh, TEPCO last year uh, did some research. They took water samples from uh, wells uh, that were in uh, the uh, facility. And uh, from one of the wells, they were able to get this kind of data. Uh, this was in October of last year, uh, cesium-134, 61,000 uh, becquerels uh, per liter, uh, which is a huge, a huge number, record high. Uh, and then cesium-137, 190,000 becquerels per liter. And of all of the, what we call the beta, uh, emissions, 77.8 million becquerels per liter. So I'm showing you in red, what I'm showing you in red are the actual uh, legally accepted uh, emissions uh, set by Japanese law. And as you can see, it's uh, for cesium 134, it's only 60 becquerels per liter, which means that it's over a uh, thousand times the uh, allowed limit. So again, with CCM 137, uh, the allowed uh, limit is only 90 becquerels per liter, but it's 190,000 as becquerels uh, per liter that were discovered in this well. So that's over 2,000 times the legal limit of uh, emissions allowed into the environment. And in regard to this uh, terminology, total beta, uh, beta um, I believe what they are referring to basically is uh, the strontium-90 uh, radioactive material. And the allowable limit is only 30 becquerels. And you can see it's 7.8 million that was discovered uh, in this well. So it shows you that it's uh, several tens of thousands of times uh, the allowable limit that you are seeing on the site from a well. So again, we are in a, a very terrible situation. I would even call it a crisis situation. In order to ensure that the crisis does not get worse, the workers on site are working every single day and will continue to work every single day uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, even as they are exposed to further radiation. Uh, although what I've been describing is quite grave, uh, we have an even uh, more serious issue facing us, which is the reactor cores have melted in units one to three. What are we going to do about that? Uh, TEPCO and the Japanese government have said, have recognized the problem, and uh, they have said that, uh, and they have put together a plan where they intend, in theory, to somehow pluck the melted uh, fuel from uh, the uh, reactor cores and m move them to a safer place where they will be stored and maintained. For this um, slide being in Japanese, it's actually a slide for that was presented by TEPCO. It presents their plan as to how they will pluck out uh, the melted fuel. <laughs> As, is, as was just explained uh, right here, uh, as he pointed out, uh, in the, on the left-hand uh, diagram, uh, in the very center, you have uh, the pressure vessel. And uh, surrounding the pressure vessel in the center, you have the containment vessel. And uh, what Tipco is saying is that uh, inside the pressure vessel, which is that smaller part uh, at, the, at the top, in the middle of the uh, diagram, uh, you have at the bottom the, uh, the, uh, the melted fuel. And they believe that the melted fuel has gone through the bottom of the uh, uh, pressure vessel and gone all the way down to the floor of the containment vessel. And it's sitting there sort of like in a big lump. 
So you have that uh, sort of test tube-like round uh, object that he was just pointing out, which is the containment vessel. And the containment vessel was supposed to be sort of the last fortress of defense to protect people from uh, radiation. Uh, however, uh, it seems that there has been damage to the containment vessel because no matter how much water you pump in, it keeps not filling up. Yes. So, uh, as you can see from how, uh, how the professor has pointed, uh, at the bottom of the smaller pressure vessel and at the bottom of the larger containment vessel, they believe, typical believes, that there are lumps of uh, melted fuel. And they have this idea that they are somehow going to uh, insert something from the top of the pressure vessel, uh, go through all the way down to the bottom of the containment vessel, and pluck out all of these lumps of melted fuels. However, uh, if they were simply to try to remove the top of the pressure vessel uh, in a dry state and uh, put something inside, that means the moment they opened it up, there would be a huge amount of radioactive materials that would be emitted into the air. Nobody could go even close. So how is TEPCO going to deal with this situation? They are saying that the first step they will take is to somehow plug the holes in the containment vessel, the larger vessel. Uh, obviously, while there, are, there must be some damage. Uh, so once they are able to repair uh, the size of the containment vessel, then they will fill it with water. And uh, after uh, the containment vessel has been flooded with water, then they will insert some equipment from above and go through the pressure vessel and also go all the way down to the bottom of the containment vessel and pluck the spent fuel, which they insist is all in a lump. And the uh, terminology that the description that uh, the professor is using is it looks like a dumpling. <laughs> it's all together in a mass. But I believe that uh, this plan that has been presented uh, is simply impossible uh, to uh, realize. The reason for this is that, first of all, the containment vessel does have holes. We don't even have the technology or ability now to even, first of all, determine where the holes are. And even if we were able to determine where the holes are, uh, how can we possibly repair them? We do not have the means to do so, I believe. I also think that um, if hypothetically one were able to, re uh, to repair the size of the containment vessel and f successfully fill it with water, then even if you were to try to plug out the uh, melted fuel from uh, above, um, I think the fundamental uh, sort of assumption of TEPCO and the government that the spent, the excuse me, that the melted fuel is sitting at the bottom in a nice little lump, like a dumpling shape, I think that is impossible. Uh, it's an uh, impossible uh, proposition. What I'm trying to say is that although this uh, picture looks like a neat little uh, uh, situation where all of the spent fuel is put very nicely into two little lumps, uh, I think in rea when one considers the severity of the accident that occurred and all of the explosions and shaking and et cetera and damage that occurred, I cannot imagine that all of the uh, every bit of that uh, melted fuel will be sitting nicely in one little uh, lump, but rather it will have spread all over the place. And it's also possible uh, not only will they have spent uh, excuse me, spread horizontally, it could be that uh, some of the spent fuel uh, could actually have gone through the floor of the containment uh, vessel as well. Uh, um, what I've just described uh, is uh, very, very logical for anyone who uh, understands uh, nuclear engineering or nuclear energy. And in recent uh, uh, months, uh, it has come to the understanding of the general public. In fact, this is a copy of a local Fukushima newspaper which printed an article about what I just described. Instead of the government or TEPCO's uh, previous explanation of the uh, uh, melted fuel being in one dumpling sh nice shape, rather it shows that probably uh, they have come, uh, they're spread all over the place uh, horizontally. Uh, in the uh, uh, area. And in fact, this is uh, the result of some uh, announcements of analysis by even uh, government sanctioned experts. In other words, uh, if TEPCO and the Japanese government uh, try to pluck out the melted fuel from above, they might be able to get some of it, but there is no way that they will be able to get all of it. Uh, so I believe that uh, this is, I think fundamentally, the idea of trying to somehow remove the melted fuel uh, from uh, the containment or pressure vessels is simply impossible to realize. And the only possible way we can eventually deal with this accident is to do what was done in Chernobyl, which is to create a concrete coffin or sarcophagus for the facility. However, there was a problem of the spent fuel uh, a pool in unit number four. A similar uh, situation uh, is present for units number one to three. They also have spent fuel pool, uh, pools, which are filled with spent uh, fuels. And they also have to be plucked out and removed. Otherwise, we cannot even think about building a sarcophagus or a concrete coffin. So I mentioned uh, how, uh, it how long it took for the spent fuel uh, rods to be uh, moved to a slightly less dangerous place uh, from uh, unit number four. But in regard to units number one to three, how long will it take for the spent fuel rods to be removed to a slightly less dangerous place? Uh, we have no idea. Uh, I think TEPCO and Japanese government really do not know how long this uh, procedure will take. 
So it is only after the cement fuel rods have been removed, safely removed, uh, to another place that a sarcophagus or, or sarcophagus, sarcophagus, excuse me, or a concrete coffin can eventually be uh, made. How many years from now will that uh, be done? Uh, I cannot even begin to uh, um, make a prediction. In fact, I probably will not be alive when the pro project starts. Uh, even if this kind of a concrete coffin or container uh, is eventually made, uh, as you know with Chernobyl, uh, it's been 29 years uh, since the accident, and uh, the first sort of concrete coffin that they made uh, surrounding uh, the uh, uh, reactor is now aging, and there are cracks and uh, much damage appearing, so they're making another secondary one uh, to surround it. So um, although the Chernobyl accident was a terrible accident, it only involved one reactor. With Fukushima, we have at the minimum one, numbers one to three, three reactors uh, that are emitting uh, dangerous radiation. Uh, so the uh, way to deal with this accident, uh, the work involved in dealing with this accident will take tens of years, hundreds of years. Uh, the uh, radioactive materials must be contained on a century-based, centuries-based um, uh, timeline. So far, I've been talking about uh, the future problems that we face, uh, how to contain the radioactive uh, materials uh, in the future. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some radioactive materials have already, unfortunately, been emitted into the environment. How much? Uh, the figures I'm showing you are actually figures that were presented by the Japanese government in a report that they presented to the IAEA. So what I'm going to be showing you is the amount of cesium-137 that was actually released into the atmosphere. So uh, you can see here, I've put a little yellow square. That shows you uh, the amount of um, cesium-137 that was released into the atmosphere as a result of the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. So the uh, unit of measurement is uh, terabecquerels. Uh, for the Fukushima uh, accident, even just with uh, unit number one, so for six to seven times is the amount of uh, just uh, the unit number one uh, released uh, six to seven times the amount of C-137 that was emitted by the bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima. And again, I repeat, this is data that is provided by the Japanese uh, government. Uh, it was number uh, unit number two that released the um, most amount, the largest amount of cesium-137 into the atmosphere. Uh, number three also uh, released some as well. Uh, but taken together, units number one, two, and three released 168 times the amount of cesium-137 that was emitted uh, by the Hiroshima bomb. So uh, uh, I would like to again uh, point out to you, this is simply uh, the amount of C-137 that was emitted into the atmosphere, into the air, uh, as a result of this accident. Uh, but as I've explained in some detail already, uh, every day more contaminated water is being produced, uh, more, more uh, contaminated water is being, uh, unfortunately, uh, going into the ocean. Uh, the final amount of C-137 uh, that have been emitted uh, into the atmosphere or into the environment uh, as a result of the Fukushima number one, uh, number one plant uh, accident is several hundred times uh, the equivalent of what was emitted by uh, the Hiroshima bomb. And it is an ongoing process. It is not yet finished. And so when uh, the first explosions occurred and a great deal of radioactive materials were uh, emitted into the air, where did they go? Well, obviously, the wind blew them uh, in certain directions. Uh, this uh, data is presented by a French research institution. Uh, it shows you where the radioactive materials uh, flew. So as you can see, uh, the red portion is the area surrounding Fukushima. And as you can see on the right-hand side, there's a set scale, a color scale that shows you the degree of radiation. Uh, the red is very bad. Yellow is uh, slightly less worse. And then it goes down to blue, which is uh, fairly good. Uh, but you can see that uh, the Fukushima area is in bright red. And surrounding it are yellow areas, which include the Tokyo and greater Kanto Plain areas. And then the rest of Japan, which is in lighter blue. Uh, as you can see, uh, the Tohoku, or an, in northeastern part of Japan, the Kanto Great Plain, where Tokyo uh, rests, uh, this area was very much contaminated. But uh, you also have to take into account a more world view. Uh, Japan is a nation that is uh, located in the temperate zone of the uh, northern hemisphere. It is an area where there are very, long, uh, very strong winds uh, blowing from the west. We call them the uh, prevailing westerlies. So as you can see, uh, the prevailing westerlies blew from the west, very strong winds, and it blew the C uh, uh, one th cesium 137s across the Pacific Ocean and contaminated much of the western coast of North America. And I believe also this is an example of why uh, nuclear power plant accidents are different from any other kinds of accidents or any other kinds of events. Uh, it's not only the site itself that is severely damaged and severely contaminated and severely hurt, but uh, it, the effects, the negative impacts of the accident spread throughout the world. 
And this is, again, data that has been presented by the Japanese government. Uh, although the prevailing westerlies might have blown a great deal of CCM-137s uh, towards uh, the Pacific Ocean, uh, more down toward the ground level, uh, you have winds uh, blowing in all kinds of directions. Some blow north, some blow west, uh, east, and uh, south. As a result, you can see how much, uh, how large an area has been contaminated. And so the area uh, in the center, which are indicated by the colors red, yellow, and green, uh, this uh, is the most highly contaminated area. Uh, as a result, uh, over over 100,000 people are not able to return to their homes. Uh, you also see some areas uh, indicated in blue, and then also some spots uh, that have been um, um, scattered uh, that are in dark green. Uh, the uh, radiation levels are very, very high there, if uh, something on the order of um, 30,000 becquerels per square meter. Uh, in Japan, uh, there are very, very strict rules and many uh, strict laws uh, that uh, govern uh, the uh, use and handling of radiation. Uh, and uh, the uh, areas where radiation uh, is an issue or there is uh, high, are high radiation levels, they're indicated as radiation control areas. It's a special designation, legal designation. So the law that existed was that uh, if you are taking an object, regardless of what that object might be, if you're taking an object out of a radiation control area to a place that is outside of that area, then regardless of what that uh, object is, if it produces uh, over 40,000 becquerels per square meter, you cannot remove that object from that uh, radiation control area. Uh, the radiation control area has uh, many, many strict rules uh, so that uh, average people such as yourselves uh, cannot, are not legally allowed to enter this area. And even for people like, such as myself who are um, experts or somehow uh, working uh, in related uh, to this uh, field, uh, even though we go into the, we are allowed to go inside this area, we cannot even take a sip of water. So until now, uh, there were very strict rules about radiation control areas. It was said that, again, to repeat, uh, you could not take anything out of this uh, area that produced over 40, that was contaminated to the point of 40,000 becquerels per square meter. Uh, in fact, anything with more than that radiation level could not exist outside of the uh, radiation control areas. Having said this, however, the areas indicated in blue uh, already uh, have objects that are uh, irradiated to the level of over 60,000 becquerels per square meter. And the spots indicated in dark green uh, have from 30,000 to 60,000 um, becquerels uh, 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 per square meter. In other words, uh, the, uh, if one is going to be very strict about the letter of the law and say that uh, anything over uh, the allowed limit uh, must uh, be uh, kept in an area that is the radiation control area, then Japan must uh, designate 14,000 square kilometers of Japan to be radiation control areas. However, the Japanese government has uh, issued a declaration that this is an emergency situation. As a result, uh, normal laws uh, do not uh, have to be followed. Uh, what they are saying, therefore, is that in these very high uh, irradiated uh, uh, radiation exposure level uh, areas, they have basically abandoned people to live there. Them away to live there is what uh, the professor said. So I said earlier that the amount of uh, C-137s uh, that have been ex ex excuse me, emitted into the atmosphere uh, is equivalent to uh, the amount that was emitted by the Hiroshima bomb, 168 times uh, that amount. So this is data that was uh, announced by the Japanese government. If we put it into becquerels, it's 15,000 terabecquerels. Uh, most of that uh, which went up into the atmosphere were uh, pushed by the uh, prevailing westerlies over the Pacific. However, uh, a great deal fell on the Tohoku region and on, uh, landed in the uh, Kanto Plain area, and that amount is 2,400 uh, terabecquerels. I'm sure um, a little, uh, some of you may not really be able to imagine uh, what uh, this amount really represents. In other words, I talk about uh, 15,000 terabecquerels or 2,400 terabecquerels. If we looked at this in terms of actual weight of the material, radioactive materials, how much do you think that would actually be in weight? Uh, all of the uh, CCM-137s uh, that were emitted by uh, the Fukushima uh, power plant accident is equivalent to 4.7 kilograms. And I mentioned earlier that uh, the C-137s that had fallen onto Japanese territory, uh, Japanese land in the Tohoku uh, and uh, Kanto regions, uh, so much so that this area should all be put under uh, the radiation uh, control area designation, all of that put together is only 750 grams in weight. I've often said that uh, radioactivity uh, or radiation is something that is very difficult to sense uh, using any of the five senses, and that's only a normal, uh, uh, that, that makes sense, because if you were able to actually sense the radiation, radioactive materials, it would be of such an amount that you would immediately die. 
So as I've said, uh, people living in these uh, contaminated areas are being exposed to radiation every single day, every single moment, and it is only natural uh, that human nature would step in and uh, people would try to take some action to try to decrease, diminish that uh, exposure level even just even a little bit. As a result, people have worked very, very hard to remove the topsoil around their homes, uh, on school grounds. Uh, they can't remove all of the topsoil from all of the mountains, all of the parks, all of the land, all of the fields, but at least around their everyday lives, they're trying to remove that. Uh, and they put the uh, contaminated soil into these uh, big bags. There are tens of millions of such bags already. But these bags are only a temporary solution. As you can see, some of the topsoil which was collected into the bags contained seeds of weeds, and the weeds eventually grew and basically broke through the uh, sides of the bags, and you can see that they're growing very healthily. So how are we going to be able to manage these bags? Uh, this is a topic that is not only pressing for us now, but also tens of years from now, 20 years from now, hundreds of years from now. I apologize. I do apologize for having gone over time so much, but I really did want to impress upon you that the accident effects are still continuing. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Kode. Um, this event is actually scheduled until uh, 4 o'clock, but uh, if there's anyone from the working press who is uh, dying to ask a question, um, then uh, please do. Um, okay, go ahead. Okay. I'm really fascinated by your presentation. Okay. My question. Can you answer yourself? Can you answer uh, yourself? I'm Khalil Hassan, Ambassador of Bahrain. If you are the Prime Minister of Japan, what you are going to do with this very complicated situation? Uh, I think there are many, many things uh, that I could do, countermeasures kind of that I could take. The first. Uh, most pressing problem that is facing us today is somehow try to stop uh, the increase of contaminated water that is being produced every day. And we also have to ensure that uh, this contaminated water uh, does not uh, seep into the environment. Uh, in order to achieve this, I think there are two things uh, that are necessary. First of all, the uh, uh, the um, uh, measure that has been taken by TEPCO and the Japanese government is to keep pouring water onto the reactor core so that uh, the mo no more uh, melting will occur. But I think a decision has to be to give up using water as a cooling uh, element. Uh, I'm thinking of alternatives such as uh, specific metals and also by uh, in special circumstances it might be that we could use air cooling as well. The second thing uh, that needs to be done is um, I said earlier that the entire Fukushima nuclear power plant facility is basically like a radioactive swamp. And if you have a swamp area, you must ensure that somehow that water from that swamp does not seep into the surrounding environment. So what needs to be done immediately is to create an underwater dam uh, that will completely surround all of the reactor buildings. This is something that I've been saying, espousing from May of 2011. It seems that uh, in recent uh, months, uh, at last, uh, the gov government and uh, TEPCO have begun to understand that uh, there is the, this necessity for a wall, as I have been um, recommending. However, uh, they have decided to embark on the building of a dam, but it is a very strange dam. It's a, it's a wall that is basically frozen soil. But uh, what is going to be necessary is a huge wall. It's going to have to be 30 meters deep, and it's going to have to be 1.4 kilometers long. I do not believe that such a frozen soil wall is uh, possible to build. I believe what is necessary, therefore, is to create a truly strong and sturdy and dependable wall that is made of concrete and steel, reinforced steel. And I think that kind of a dam or under underground dam or wall needs to be made immediately. So that was a very technical uh, answer to uh, your question, but I'd like to now uh, talk in more general terms about some of the countermeasures I would take. Uh, first of all, uh, when uh, immediately after the accident occurred, a declaration was issued by the government uh, saying that this accident was an emergency situation. And when you have an emergency situation uh, legally declared, that means that regular laws are, are put on hold. What that means is that uh, people can be thrown away into areas where normally people should not be. Uh, I think uh, if the Japanese government uh, should do everything in its power to be able to create a situation where it can lift this emergency situation uh, declaration. Uh, in other words, um, I believe that uh, they should not be thinking so much about uh, happy events like the Olympics at a time like this. Uh, your question also said uh, was that uh, if I were Prime Minister Abe, what would be the first thing that I would do? The first thing I would do as Prime Minister is remove, evacuate all of the children who are in the contaminated areas. Many, many other things I'd like to do, but I will stop here and take the next question. Free no journalist no Fujita Hiroki to mention. Ano scientists for accurate radiation information, SARI, というですね科学者の団体がありまして、例えばあのクスフォード大学のウェイドアリソン先生。あまりにも愚かな。
So the question was about uh, an association called uh, Scientists for um, Accident uh, uh, Radiation. Is that atomic radiation? Uh, and it is represented by some uh, famous scientists, uh, such as professors of Oxford, et cetera. And the general um, uh, tone uh, of the scientists is that, uh, the general uh, conclusion of the scientists is that with low levels of radiation, such as 100 millisieverts per year, uh, this is not necessarily bad for one's health. It might even actually be good for one's health, and it's not necessarily something that would cause cancer. There's no new reason to keep these, this contaminated water uh, in tanks. Uh, it could just be released into the environment. Uh, there's no reason to decontaminate uh, areas. Uh, kids uh, in that area can play outside freely. Uh, so what do you think about And these uh, scientists are not alone. They seem to be gaining more and more supporters. What do you think about this? Uh, the response is that I think it is an extremely foolish way of looking at uh, this matter. Uh, radio, uh, radioactive materials, or the uh, idea of radiation, was discovered in 1942. And since then, a great deal of research has been done on the effects of uh, radioactivity and radiation on, on humans. Uh, and uh, the result uh, uh, is more or less um, accepted by the scientific community, which is that uh, regardless of how low level radiation you are speaking about, there are always negative effects uh, on uh, living uh, beings. And that is the basis of the many, many laws that exist in almost all countries of the world that limit radiation exposure uh, that is allowed. Uh, for example, uh, in Japan, it's only one millisievert per year of radiation exposure that is allowed for the average person. Even for someone such as myself, a specialist in this field who is exposed to more radiation than the average person, we're only allowed to have 20 millisieverts of radiation uh, exposure uh, each year. So people who say uh, that it's good for your health, uh, that uh, you don't have to worry about these things, then I think the first thing they should do if they really believe this is work to remove these restrictions, these laws in all the countries of the world. Uh, but so long as these laws exist on the books, I believe it is the responsibility of each government to abide by them. Okay, um, I'm sorry we're gonna have to uh, uh, wrap this up because uh uh, club needs to prepare for the evening event. So, uh, but uh, Mr. Quere has agreed to stay until about 4:30. So uh, we have um, interview room um, uh, down the hallway, and he'll be around to take your questions if uh, anyone is still interested in asking him a questions. And uh, as a as a customary, uh, I'd like to present uh, Mr. Quere the uh, one-year honorary uh, membership. And uh, since he has retired from uh, Kyoto University, I'm sure he'll be uh, seeing us, uh, our, we'll be seeing him ar uh, around here. Uh, Thank you very much. OK, well, this is it. Uh, thanks for coming for the uh, press conference. Thank you very much.